Tim, thank you for coming. We first got in touch because of a shared interest in Jordan Peterson. You wrote the first article for The Spectator, I think, at about the same time as I brought out my documentary on Jordan Peterson last year. And you also have a really keen interest in Alan Watts. And a lot of people have, have made this comparison that Jordan Peterson in some ways is doing for Western religion what Alan Watts did for Eastern religion back in the 50s and 60s. And I think it's a really interesting topic to explore. Do you think it's a good comparison? Well, also, Alan Watts demystified Christianity. I mean, as Peterson is doing, in that sense, he is a precursor of Peterson. In other words, he tried to rethink the real meaning of Christianity without any need for magical thinking or, you know, he wasn't religious in that conventional sense, you know, that he, he thought there was a great God watching us all, you know, he was, debunk he was debunking that idea um, and he was trying to get at the deeper questions of what the Bible was trying to reach, M much often through the Gnostic Gospels that he would, he would refer to, as, as Peterson does also, that there is this wisdom in the book, you know, that is largely hidden from view by the church. You know, much of the interesting things about the Bible are kept out of sight. Um, and I, I think in that sense, uh, he is um, he's certainly a precursor to Peterson in, in that he's involved in this great project of what Peterson calls revivifying the substrate of the Western ideological project, if you're not ideological project, the philosophical project of, of uh, individual freedom and so forth. And from what I understand about the, the Gnostics versus the kind of Christian tradition is that the Gnostics were about a lived experience of, of God. So it's more of, a, of, a, of, a, of an inner spiritual knowing, is that? I don't know much about the Gnostics, but I, I do think that sounds about right. And that's what, that's what Watts was about. You know, he was about the immediate present experience of your, of your life, you know, and, and about, you know, very much emphasize. I mean, that, this is one of the ways he does differ from Peterson, because Peterson, in a way, is, is all about having a goal for the future. And, and Watts was not about that. He was all about saying, let the future take care of itself, which I think he, he, he quoted Jesus about that, you know, care not for the morrow, consider the lilies of the field, etc., which he said, this is never really preached anymore, you know, because it's a subversive message, which is like, don't worry about tomorrow, you know, you'll be fine. And, 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 and that's quite, quite contrary to the sort of things that Peterson talks about. But funny enough, I, you know, last time I met Jordan Peterson, I asked him that very thing, because I said, well, how are you coping with all this pressure that you're under? And he said, um, well, you know, I just don't think about tomorrow. I'm constantly, and I said, well, that's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? You know, he says, and, and, you know, and he said, yeah, but you know, it's the only way I can get through it really, is just by well, been living all the present all the time. So oddly enough, you know, the idea, there's something in, in both of the ideas. I mean, they can both become corrupted in a way. You know, if you, if you think of, of thinking of living Peterson's goal-directed life, you could, I think, very easily find yourself stuck in the future, psychologically. And if you lived Watts's non-goal-directed life, which is kind of, he was kind of anti-goal, I think, by nature of, you know, zenness and, and living in the now, um, you could get stuck in that, because I think that can be quite a, quite a, I mean, it's all very well to live in the present, but, you know, if you sort of slap someone around the face and 10 minutes later, you turn around to them and say, what are you still going on about that for? That was 10 minutes ago. You know, it's like, it doesn't make much sense, does it? So, you know, there's, there's a place for these things. But, but they're, they're both, they're, what they have in common is they're both brilliant, brilliant teachers whose minds are not merely great minds, but have great communication skills. That is quite rare, you know, for somebody of that level of, intelligence to have such a, a flair for expressing it and also both of them really were interpreters you know they in some ways they're not they're certainly what's more so than, than 
Peterson was not really an, an original thinker. He was just very, very brilliant at extracting meanings from other thinkers and other traditions. And Peterson, to some extent, though I think he's, um, you know, he's, he's, he's more of an original thinker, but he's, you know, he relies very heavily on people like Nietzsche and, and Solzhenitsyn. Um, but he does formulate, I think, and Joseph Campbell, but I mean, I think he, he formulates a very coherent understanding um, out, of, out of those sources and moves them on, I think. In other words, his, 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 his discovery, as he would put it, of an essential DNA of all the great stories, which is something people have been, you know, edging towards ever since the Golden Bow and, 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 and uh, the, the Frazier book. Uh, he think, I think he moves that on a very long way. Um, and I think he, he, really, he really develops that, that, that theory of narrative as, as a form of expressing things that we cannot express yet by words, which we cannot conceptualize. And that's not, you know, that's what, which is one of the reasons I'm very interested in Peterson. Watts doesn't really talk about narrative in that in that way. So that's another big difference is I, th I think Peterson is is concerned with mythological narratives and and, and Watts is, is not really. He's interested in understanding what we can learn from Eastern thought, how it can be combined with Western religion. And um, and they're both mavericks because they, you know, they take a very radical view in both cases, not only of Christianity, but I mean, in what's his case of, of Eastern philosophy. I mean, his, his philosophy is very unlike other, you know, when you read about Eastern philosophers and Zen, you know, it's all about sitting cross-legged, which he called the um, aching back school of Zen, I think. Anyway, so he, was, he wasn't even particularly interested in meditation. I mean, you know, they taught it, I mean, he wasn't bothered. You know, so he was very sort of, uh, he was very much of the, you know, that's why I think he became more and more of a Taoist as, as he went on, because he wasn't, he wasn't much into self-discipline, which I think, uh, I think Jordan Burns Peterson is. On the point of their differences, and especially on the, the difference between Alan Watts's let go um, and, you know, not worrying about the future and Peterson's kind of goal-driven, pick up your cross, walk up the hill, take responsibility, they were, they were both, okay, Peterson's popular now. What's also, I think, very much of his time and place. Do you think those two messages uh, kind of fit into two different cultural eras? Do you think what Watts was saying would have the same impact if you were saying it now? And no, I think that's a very, a very astute point. I, I think they are products of their time. You know, I mean, I think Watts came out of a time when the, the culture was very uptight, you know, and it was very... You know, it was very much the, you know, the, the, the tyrant king was running things, you know, and it was very authoritarian, it was very straight-laced. I mean, his peak was in the 50s, you know, just before... Um, I mean, he was teaching through the 30s, 40s and 50s. I think he started in the 30s. Um, but he was, he was at a time when, the, the, as it were, the, the straight jacket that had to be re loosened was one of sort of, you know, autocratic, hyper-controlling, fearful psychology. And, and now, as it were, his take has been taken to its absolute extreme. And, and, and Peterson is, as it were, acting as the antithesis to, to bring it back to, the, to some greater understanding again. So I think, yeah, you could see them more as, as two poles of an underlying unity, which would be a very Zen way of looking at it. You know. I know you describe yourself as an atheist. What is it about these two figures that you find fascinating? Well, because I think there's a sense in which they're both atheists, a sense, you know. Um, I think the word atheist is, is, is laden with kind of, I, I think firstly I'm, I'm willing to use that word because I immediately want to distance myself from A, you know, dogmatic Christians, and B, new age idiots, you know, so I, who talks about spirituality all the time. I'm, so I'm very quick, probably too quick to use the word um, atheist, and it's probably not the right word, because it, 
it, it suggests a Richard Dawkins kind of narrowness of mind about these things. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not, put it this way, I'm not a scientific materialist. I don't think you just look at the world and what you're seeing is just stuff. You know, I mean, I absolutely don't think that at all. That is a very, very mysterious element, which is revealed in science. You know, I don't think there's anything controversial about that. I mean, you've only got to look at, at quantum physics and, and, and recent scientific discoveries to be, for it to be very plain that something bloody weird is going on. You know, it, it, it's not just the 19th, 18th century view that we're all sort of hard machines, and that's crazy. Um, so when I say I'm an atheist, I mean, I don't believe, you know, that if I believe in God, that I will, you know, be rewarded in heaven or even rewarded on earth necessarily. Um, and if I say I'm, you know, an atheist, it doesn't mean that, it means that I don't sort of, you know, if I see the Buddha on the road, I will kill him. You know, so I think that's that, that sort of idea. But really there's not, there's, not, there's not kind of a word for how I feel myself to be which is somewhere on the margins of a belief in a great mystery that's going on and the, the peculiarity of existence. So I'm very against, I, it's not merely I'm not a scientific materialist. I hate scientific materialism. I think it's a destructive, stupid ideology that is largely responsible for all sorts of problems in, in, in today's well, it's given us a great deal, but also psychologically, I think it's been a very arid and inaccurate way of looking at the world. And growing up as I did in the 1950s, which is almost the high point of, of, of you know, scientific materialism, which really said this, that he said, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. That's the scientific view of scientific materialism. If you can't measure the damn thing, there, it's, it's a, a figment of your imagination. And that includes consciousness. It's like we can't measure consciousness, so there's no consciousness. It's an epiphenomena of your, I mean, it's just, don't be stupid. You know, that's just like saying, yeah, what you, you know, but you're thinking that. How come you're thinking that if it's just an epiphenomena? I mean, it's, you know, it, it's denying the most fundamental reality that we have, which is the inside of our own heads which is our consciousness. There's no more fundamental relationship, re re reality than that. But people say, oh, well, that's not real. Well, that, what, what the hell is real? You know, if that's not real, that's ridiculous. And those kind of, you know, things are all too common, I think. And that's really the, 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 the in as much as it's thought about at all, you might call it the default view of this society. It strikes me just on that point that both Watts and Peterson have a, they have a strong metaphysical element to what they're saying. Um, maybe in different ways, but I don't know, that's actually my question is, are they pointing, even though they're taking it from you know, East and West, and it's ostensibly quite different, are they pointing to some similar metaphysical reality, do you think, or is it different? You know, I, I don't know any more than I know about the nature of a metaphysical reality. You know, I mean, I suspect that there is a metaphysical reality, in other words, a reality beyond that, which, but I don't know the nature of it, you know what I mean? And I don't know what it is, and I don't, I can't, you know, I have a sense that it's good. In a way, are they not both pointing to the, I mean, you described it as a mystery. Yeah. There is a humility in, in Peterson, I don't know what's quite, quite so well, but I, I get a sense there's, there's a humility in I both mean, of their perspectives. I, I really want so yeah, that's a really good point because what it's about is, is the acceptance of uncertainty. You know, I mean, I, and Peterson is very big on this. He's saying, you don't know anything. You're very small and the world is very big and you've got the whole of history before you, the whole of the future ahead of you and the whole world around you and you're this tiny little dot of, you know, have some humility. What the hell do you know? You know, and, and, and Watts, one of Watts's greatest books was, was The Wisdom of Insecurity, which is really the same principle. He's saying, look, you don't know. You know, have humility in the face of the mystery, which is that in reality, you know, things are very, very hard to understand. And I suppose that's a, 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 a perception I've had with me since I was quite a, well, as long as I can remember. It's like, what the hell is going on? And why is everybody so down with it? You know, because it strikes me as bizarre and perplexing. And, um, 
and everyone else doesn't seem to, most people don't seem to register that. And, and so they both speak to me in saying, you know, life is ineffable and unknowable. So they're very much both in the same camp now. But it feels to me like their response to that is different because for Watts, in the, in the more Taoist response to that would be to surrender into the, that unknowable mystery. Um, and your ego um, isn't trying to control it, whereas Peterson is uh, saying, to an extent at least, um, find meaning, find responsibility, um, you know, find some direction, some goal in the future. And I'm not sure whether those things square with each other. Yeah, I don't think they do square with each other, but I do think the, 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 the sort of Watson stroke Eastern point of view is that you have an essential inner wisdom that we don't we don't use enough, you know, and, and that we need to acknowledge that mysterious centre of ourselves, which which is the at the heart of, of real knowing. As for Peterson, I'm not sure, except that I would say that he does speak very much about humility. He speaks a lot about how, you know, you have to, the beginnings of wisdom is the fear of God. The idea that you, and, 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 the, and that Satan was an intellectual and so forth. The idea that, that, the, that the knowledge that you possess is the beginning and the end of the world is the, you know, the ultimate sin of pride. You know, and, and, and so actually they are quite similar in that because they're saying, just understand you know, your place in things, which is at one level, as Watts would say, you know there is something godlike in you but you know the human side of you is 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 woefully inadequate. You know, I think I think that sort of yeah. I think that's I think it's interesting how what's to, uh, where how Jordan Peterson talks about how your your pathetic little weasels. You know, he's got this, this idea that you're you're essentially an original. You know, this kind of original sin idea that you are just weak and and, and, and pathetic. And I, I think that would be quite alien to Watts, who was sort of you know much more of the sort of you know, what's inside you is, 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 it can be relied upon, even though it can be unreliable, you know, so, so he, you know, he wouldn't make the point as always trust, you know, always trust your inner voice. He says, you, you're, you're in a position where you have, life is essentially to be in a position of a gambler who's making bets um, uh, 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 and there are no certain outcomes or a, or a yachtsman who's trying to tack and, and, and sail through very unpredictable waters, you know, so there's no clear way forward and you have no guarantees of a good outcome. And I think that, you know, unlike religion, which even, even Buddhism, which says, you know, just meditate and you'll be, everything will be beautiful. It's like, really? You know, and, 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 and Peterson likewise, you know, he'll go, you know, you know this, is the, this is your best bet is to, is to follow this path, but it doesn't guarantee anything. You know, it's, it's, it, you know, you can still have horrible bad luck and dreadful things can happen to you and no one's controlling those things. It's just, you know, it's just bad shit happens to people and you can't control that. So this sort of, yeah, there's, there's an element you know, if humility, I certainly think Watts is more about, as you say, letting go of the need to control things. Um, but there's an element of that, I think, in Jordan Peterson too. And it, it more in a, in a sense that letting go of the need to know things in a strange way, you know, or the need to know of your certainties. Would you say there's more of a utopianism in Watts? Because with Peterson, he says, you have to take a poison. All, all you have is the choice of which poison to take. You have to take a poison. Whereas Watts, there's a sort of sense of maybe a bit more of a utopian element to it. I don't think it's utopian. I think it's um, probably more optimistic. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't think he, he, he thinks there's some... I don't think he sees the utility of suffering, perhaps, in the way that, uh, in the way that um, you know, Jordan Peterson does. He doesn't necessarily... Think one should be beating oneself up. There's probably enough, you know. We probably have, and neither does Peter, to be fair. But I mean, you know, I, I think there's there's not that that sort of that sense that you've got to go down into the depths before you can emerge fully formed. I think Watts is just like 
just stop trying so hard and you'll be all right. You know, <laughs> that's what we could sum up is, you know, just to stop straining, you know, uh, to do things. And, and, and Watts was much misunderstood at the time. And Watts didn't like the beatniks, for instance, you know, the whole Kerouac, do what you feel type of thing. He was very much dis disapproved of that nonsense and thought it was just very adolescent, really. Um, so yeah, I think I think there's uh, there are differences and there are similarities, but I, I I feel that they were on the same path. And Watts had a lot of admiration for Jung, uh, even though he didn't talk about him quite as, as much as Jordan Peterson, and maybe wasn't playing that same role of reviving Jung to the culture. But one of one of my favorite um, lectures, uh, he talks about Jung in the Shadow in particular. Um, and that strikes me as an interesting point where they, they meet, because the shadow is maybe one of the most popular Jungian ideas that Peterson is bringing back into the culture. Um, so, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know much about Watts and his take on Jung, but how much did, do you think Jung kind of influenced his thinking, or how important was it? Not really aware of it. I mean, you know, it must have. I mean, I, you know, maybe there. And if you've seen that lecture, but it hasn't stuck with me. I, I've sort of seen everything and listened to everything that he's done. And so, I can't imagine that it was a repeating motif. I mean, I'd have to say I'd be very interested to see that lecture. But I don't, you know, I don't remember. He talks t talks about Freud a, a fair bit. Of course, Jung was into Eastern philosophy himself, and 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 that's why I didn't immediately think of Jung because he frames it in those terms. But. But in actual fact, the idea of there being polarities within us, you know, which is essentially the, the Jungian, well, that everything's opposing forces, you know, um, is exactly what he, I mean, certainly his book, The Book, is, is all about, you know, the polarities that, uh, that, that, that are, are at work in, inside the human uh, psyche. I don't know how much this is referring to the question you asked me, but it was it's what I was thinking about while you were asking it. Um, and uh, it makes me think, that this idea of, I don't know if balance is the right word, but there's certainly, but certainly the idea that there are, that what appear to be opposites are in fact not opposites at all, but are in fact, you know, you know, that the more that you push in one direction, the more that goes in that direction, the more you go in that. There's, you know, the same would, it would, he would talk the same about things like free will, saying, you know, well, it depends. If you look at it one way, it's free will. If you look at it the other way, it's total determinism. If you push past the determinism, it looks like free will. There's a constant flipping of these of these two poles. So, and he talks about women a lot in the same way as Peterson does. So the male and the female, he talks about those archetypes of the woman being unknowable and dark and represented by the earth and the underground, you know, and, and, and she'll be damned if she'll be known. You know, the women are always unknowable in his, his view and, and men are much more, well, he always divides the world into spiky and wiggly, I think, you know, and, and, and the men are much more spiky, you know, and sort of, can you de demonstrate exactly this and this and this and sort of, and women are much more like water and the idea that they're much more and these sort of ideas of gender, these are kind of taboo ideas in the sort of, you know, on the, on, 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 on the left in politics today, the idea that there can be some kind of fundamental difference in the male and female principles, but clearly it was a Jungian to that extent. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and it's a real shame that those kind of things are unsayable. It's one of the reasons that we seem to have lost our way as, as, as a thinking culture, because once we start to deny the way in different ways men and women put their world together, you know, and say, well, that's, you know, that's either irrelevant or it doesn't exist, or worse, it's offensive or oppressive to even suggest the idea, it strikes me as a very dangerous denial of reality. I wonder if part of it is due to the fact that, so Watts pointed out that in, in the Western mindset, we tend to see objects and they're distinct from one another and in the Eastern mindset, especially Taoism, there's more a sense that things mutually arise, like a flower and a bee are, in mm. essence, the same thing, because they yes. kind of exist without each other. Really different ways to see the world. I think he, he even uses the example somewhere of Japanese art and uh, art you might find in a motel in the Midwest in America, where it's like a fruit bowl, it's right in your face and there's hardly any space around it. Whereas in Japanese art, 
a lot of white space and just an object yeah. in the space. Or the human figure is tiny and, the, yeah. and, and the, the natural landscape is enormous as opposed to the man on his horse in England mm. being in the foreground. Mm. Yeah, so what's the point? So, so for me, um, the point is we find it incredibly difficult to even hold that idea that polarities can imply one another rather than one being better than the other. Exactly, yeah. yes. And what I was going to ask is, so very early on in one of the Bible lectures, Peterson mentions almost offhand, he'd quite like to do something around Taoism. And there's kind of the, the sense for me with Peterson that he's talked a lot about the West and Western philosophy, but there is potential to also talk about the East. Do you think that's necessary? Do you think the East needs to come in in a new way into Western culture and the problems we're facing now? Well, absolutely. I mean, and that's something Jung was doing, you know, and... and um you know, and, and, and many poets do, and, and people, people like um, Eliot, you know, and uh, uh, I mean, like, there, there is a, how can you ignore Eastern wisdom? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a whole fund, you know, of, of fascinating ideas. Once you get past, you know, the, rather like Christianity, it's like once you get past the religious uh, iconography and, superstructure and instead of just going oh well, this is all superstitious nonsense and go yeah but what's underneath it what 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 what's, what are these stories trying to tell us you know which is exactly what peterson is doing and really what what's it saying what are these stories what is the buddha story was was it what's that trying to tell us actually mm. you know and, and it's not like you know buddha has got all the answers he says what what's buddha trying to tell us and what are the buddhist tradition trying to tell us you know ignore all the Ignore all the sort of, you know, kissing the gold Buddha to, you know, the, the, all these things become co-opted by religion. And what Watts was doing was getting to the root of Eastern religion and saying, well, what does it really mean? And that's exactly what Peterson has been doing, and, and to Western religion as well, but Peterson has been mainly concentrating on Western religion and saying, well, what does this mean? And, and what do these stories tell us? And I think that's gripping to me, you know, and they're, so they're both, they're both deep, delving under the surface of, of what we kind of have dismissed as trivia in a way, you know, or as I said before, epiphenomena, you know, that, 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 that these stories have much more profound meanings than we understand. What's interesting for me about hearing Alan Watts talk about the shadow is that in his personal life, um, you know, especially in later years, there's been a lot of talk about his own personal shadows and his kind of problems with, with alcohol, for example. Um, it'd be great to hear a little bit about, you know, I wonder how much that, that seems like a contradiction to me and probably a lot of people, that he's very wise, incredibly um, deep thinker, and then his family life is really quite chaotic, it seems, compared to Peterson, who seems like a different figure, at least culturally, he's quite kind of upstanding. Yeah, well, no, absolutely. I mean, his personal life was a disaster. I mean, he had seven children, I think, by three wives. You know, certainly the one he had four children well hated him until her she died. You know, I mean, uh, and I mean, he he was a womanizer. I mean, you know, he was a, he slept around a lot, um, and uh, he was a drunk and he took a lot of drugs. I mean, there's no, he's very different from Peterson um, in that sense. But again, that's of its time, you know, he was, he was pushing out the boundaries of, you know, everyone drank in the fifties anyway, you know, I mean, everyone was pissed all the time, you know, I, 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 so it wasn't quite, but he was an alcoholic, let's be honest. And he ended up marrying an alcoholic who was dragged him down and, um, you know, uh, and clearly his relationship with you know, he's very, I mean, I don't want to get into psychoanalyzing him, but he had a very interesting relationship with his mother, um, who was clearly the biggest figure in, in his life and who encouraged all his, all, all, all his fascination in Eastern philosophy and had sort of, it started with her having all these Eastern artifacts in her home. And, uh, you know, he was, he, he, the mother was a, a big figure for him. I get the sense listening to both Watts and Peterson, there, there's a really strong performative element to what they're doing that, that I think pe it, people find really compelling. Well, they've both got tremendous charisma. You know, that, that, I mean, that, that, so inevitably that's one of the things that attracts people to them. Um, but there's also 
So what is the nature of that performance? Well, firstly, in, in the case of Watts, he's very funny and has a wonderful laugh. And what's often missed about Peterson is he's also very funny. You know, if you watch his, sort of, some of his lectures, he's hilarious, you know, and, and you know, sometimes he comes across as this very dour, sort of, you know, rather angry old white man, you know, and he's not at all, and he's very, got a great soft side, and he's, he's, you know, you can see that his students would have loved him because he's so sort of, he's so sort of mocking and self-mocking, and he's very witty. Um, so they're natural YouTube stars, both of them. They're both rather handsome. They're both rather unconventional looking, you know, and, and, um, and they're both genius communicators of ideas, and they both have rather lovely voices, you know, which is also, you know, they talk like that, you know, it's not going to work so well, but they've got, you know, Watts has got this wonderful, deep, booming English public school voice, which is, like, wonderful, you know, it's like uh, just your really dream uncle talking to you. And, 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 and um, Peterson has got this very folksy kind of, you know, you Canadian... He does a very good Kermit impersonation, I think. I don't think he sounds like Kermit unless he wants to sound like Kermit. But, um, but he, has, he has that sort of real approachability, you know, that, that I think um, that, comes from, that comes from a deep knowledge of your subject, actually. You know, I think because I, because I think they both really have thought through to the very root what it is they're saying. So they're very careful with what they're saying. It has a tremendous power because so many people you hear talking and sounding extremely clever. But when you think about it, actually, what the hell were you talking about? You know, and, and it's actually, I mean, I feel that about, I won't name names, but, you know, there are, there are a number of psychologists and thinkers, you know, and I'll sit and listen to them talk and think, hmm, that's really interesting. And then I'll think about it a bit more. I think... Actually, it's not really interesting. You know, what you've been saying there is something that sounds like something that's interesting. But actually, when you really examine it, it's quite hollow, you know, and, and there's, a kind of, there's a kind of posturing to it, you know, because there's no real deep knowledge underneath it. And when you come to Peterson and Watts, who I think are towering figures in their way, um, you know, you can talk about, you know, Freud and Jung being towering figures and Nietzsche being towering figure and you know um, trouble is that most people don't understand them you know and don't read them and they don't have a you know they don't have a, a, a there's no way into them for, for an average you know consumer of information and what what Pearson and Watts provide is is a wonderful conduit for very you know difficult ideas and, and, and interesting and this is this is interesting about Peterson and, and Watts as well, is that because they're mavericks, you know, Watts was always derided in, in England, certainly, you know, by Oxford and Cambridge, you know, they just thought he was a joke because he, because he was very understandable, you know, and people, and everybody understood what he was saying and they really didn't like that very much. You know, and Watts, and, and, and likewise, Peterson is, is ostracised by many of the, of the academy just as, as Watts was. I mean, Watts... Didn't even, didn't even get a degree in the end, I don't think. You know, they were outsiders, and, and outsiders always have the most interesting take somehow, you know, but, but, but Peterson too is being, you know, his own colleagues are sort of disowning him because he doesn't, he doesn't sign up to their, you know, their articles of faith. And Watts was exactly the same. He didn't sign up to their articles of faith and thought they were quite shallow and obviously they didn't appreciate that very much. So Tim, just to close, um, we've talked to you before about Jordan Peterson, so I wanted to take an opportunity to ask about Alan Watts just in particular. So Peterson has had a huge impact on people in this kind of post-truth, radical, relativist world um, and changing the way people view themselves and their lives. What do you think Watts can bring right now to to that same audience looking for meaning, looking for some direction? Well, I think the, what Watts brings to it is, is partly that, in a strange way, and it is, it is slightly different from what Peterson is saying, he was a great believer in the sort of law, the law of sort of reverse, I think he called it, the reverse principle, you know, which is that the more you 
try, the more you fail. The more you look for something, the more you fail to find it, you know, which is sort of slightly different from Peter's. And he's, you know, he, he was, and so what, what I think he's, he's got to offer is, is this kind of willfulness towards always living in, and they do have something in common here, actually. They, this, this willfulness towards living in the future, you know, and that, that, we, that, that our whole project is about arriving at some hypothetical future. And, and that, you know, when you get to that future, um, you'll just be thinking of another future. So you'll never get there, you know, and, and he's, and that's, I think in this sort of late capitalist, hyper-competitive society, that idea, you know, very simple and increasingly popular idea that, you know, if you think about the future all the time, you'll never get there. And you would think, well, that's not Peterson. However, Peterson also talks about this. He talks about he talks about the Sermon on the Mount himself. He talks about what the proper, what the proper unit of thinking about the world is. And he also talks about that, consider the leaders of the field, interestingly. And he says that the proper unit for thinking about is the day. You know, so it's not, you know, constantly making, I mean, yes, it's important to have a goal, but you know, he oddly enough does, he does, um, have a, a, a conjoining with, with what's there, you know, and, uh, and, and, and as I told you, he said, I, I have to think about the day, and he does, he does, now I'm not quite sure how you marry that up, you know, the idea that you've got to have this grand goal and you've got to think about the day, and I'm not sure Peterson, you know, he's, he will doubtless be able to seamlessly stitch it together, but I, you know, I can't quite work out how those two things coexist. But it's, it, he's very aware of that, you know, he's very aware that people get... He's very suspicious of the grand plan, you know, and certainly in, in terms of the Marxist idea of the grand plan, that, you know, if you, if you set this vision of ide this ideal vision ahead of you, you know, you will be rewarded with a heaven on earth, you know, and he's very, he's very suspicious of that, obviously, you know, so the idea that there's some kind of place you can get to. Um, so his, so Peterson's vision is much more about, you know, taking responsibility for yourself, but, but I think he would be very careful in how he defined responsibility and, you know, and uh, and that doesn't mean everything's your fault, you know, and, and uh, I think that, you know, I think, I think that's something Watts was very concerned with, he was saying like, you know, it was a very guilt-ridden society, the society that he was teaching in, and he was, and that's something that Zen itself was created, really, to remove the guilt of Japanese society when everybody was worrying about if they gave, you know, a beautiful box to their neighbours for dinner, how much do they give back, and you know, there's a whole highly ritualised society, the whole, the whole idea. Of, of removing that anxiety, you know, and, and Watts was certainly involved with that. And uh, yeah, Peterson is, uh, Peterson inflects on these central ideas, but somehow in my mind, and I can't prove it to you, that if, if, you, if you follow them through to the end, I think they're probably serving the same fundamental truth. Perfect place to end. Tim, thank you very much. Thank you.